All right, so last video we saw the rise of the Ming Dynasty and we saw all of their accomplishments. Now we're going to look at one of their mistakes. Uh, you know, eventually during the Age of Exploration, right, the Europeans begin to arrive in Southeast Asia. Uh, during this time period, the first Europeans to arrive in China during the Age of Exploration is going to be the Portuguese. Right? Uh, and when the Portuguese show up, uh, the Europeans did have some things that the, the Ming were interested in. Uh, such as eyeglasses, mechanical clocks, right? Uh, uh, and, and the Portuguese and the Europeans after them were very impressed by the Chinese. They were particularly impressed by how literate their society was. This was a time period in, in Europe where literacy was not widespread, but China compared to Europe was a very literate, very well-read, highly educated society. Also, some of those Christian missionaries, particularly the Jesuits of the Catholic Church, are very impressed with Confucianism, uh, that, that Chinese philosophy. It's not really religion, it's more of a philosophy. Uh, and they are interested in its moral teachings and how some of the moral teachings in Confucianism were somewhat similar to what the Church was teaching back in Europe, such as uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Confucianism has a very similar rule or idea. But overall, the Chinese, particularly the Chinese government, are not very impressed with the Europeans. They view the Europeans as barbarians, and who can blame them? We were just talking about how the Europeans were undereducated compared to the Chinese. Also, the Chinese uh, prize cleanliness. This is a time period where Europeans did not bathe often uh, compared to the Chinese uh, uh, standards uh, of keeping up themselves and cleanliness. The Europeans fell far short and, and compared to Chinese etiquette, Chinese way of doing things, the Europeans were a bit loud and a bit raucous. Uh, so the Chinese really considered the Europeans barbarians and therefore felt like the Europeans didn't really have a whole lot to offer them. And maybe at first that's true, but what we'll see is that in China, because of one reason, because of Confucianism's value on tradition, right? The Chinese don't change a whole lot when it comes to their technology. At the same time, the Europeans are going to go through something called the scientific revolution and develop all kinds of stuff. And eventually the Europeans are going to move ahead of the Chinese. So it would be interesting to see if there was more of a relationship of mutual, mutual respect, what would have happened to China. See, in, in Chinese history, the way a dynasty usually always works is first the dynasty uh, uh, is created uh, and they rule successfully for many years, but then things begin to decline. The central government begins to co collapse, rebellions happen, invasions begin, particularly uh, in the past from uh, the Mongols and the Manchurians. And that that's important in China. Because in China, they, they have something similar to divine right of kings. It's this idea called the mandate of heaven that if everything is going well inside China, right, that means heaven is backing up the emperor, so you have to obey him and follow him. But if things begin to go horribly wrong, particularly if there's like natural disasters, famine, uh, earthquakes, plagues, that would be a sign that the emperor has lost the mandate of heaven, therefore you can rebel. It's, it's like a divine right of kings and social contract had a baby you would get mandate of heaven, right? You have to obey unless there are signs they've lost the mandate of heaven, almost like the social contract's been violated, then you can rebel and form a new government. Well, you look at the end of the Ming Dynasty, you had a series of weak rulers, corruption within the government increased, uh, the, the, the civil service exam was not given like it was supposed to, people were getting jobs when they weren't qualified, Taxes were going up, making people unhappy, peasant unrest. Then a poor harvest, natural disaster. A plague, an epidemic, natural disaster. So word began to spread that the Ming had lost the mandate of heaven. You can now rebel. And that's what happens. Unfortunately for China, the, the rebellion is led by a peasant farmer named Li. And so you have this uneducated, illiterate, peasant farmer with an army of also illiterate peasant farmers 
overthrowing the Ming dynasty. And they actually pull it off. Li and his, his peasant farmers, they actually invade Beijing. The last Ming emperor actually hangs himself from a tree in the imperial garden because he's so distraught. Uh, Li captures the palace, declares himself the new emperor. So now you've got this guy in the imperial city uh, sitting on the throne claiming he's the emperor and he can't even write the word emperor. Uh, also, uh, he's not the best leader uh, ever. He has a hard time controlling his men who have a growing reputation for violence. And many Chinese, they are distraught by what's happened. I mean, yes, the Ming were not fantastic by the end of it, but at least they weren't, you know, an uneducated, illiterate peasant. And this weakened China, right? This internal rebellion weakened China, and it's going to allow a group of outsiders to invade and take it over, a group called the Manchus. The Manchus uh, were from Manchuria, China's northern neighbor, just north of the Great Wall. Uh, and what's interesting is the Manchus had been influenced by the Chinese for centuries. So if you looked at what was going on inside Manchuria, their society was highly organized around these military units called banners. There's eight banner units, right? Uh, and you lived with your banner, right? You socialized with your banner. Society was based, right, around these banner units. So it's somewhat of a militaristic society. And you look at their government, they started to model their government on the Chinese style, including civil service exams. And then as the Ming Dynasty was falling apart, when people were, were becoming dissatisfied, the Manchus reached out to these Chinese and started to recruit them to come into Manchuria and help organize their military, help organize their government in a Chinese way. Also brought in Chinese uh, craftsmen that knew how to make cannons, who knew how to make firearms, who knew how to use them, and hired them to train the Manchus. So when the Ming Dynasty falls apart, just north of China, here is this group of people that's highly organized around their banner units. They already have a Chinese style of government. They have a Chinese style of military. They already have Chinese people inside their military and government that they pay and treat very well. So if you were a, a Chinese official, on one hand, you have the illiterate peasant farmer Li claiming to be the emperor, right, and his peasant army that well, are extremely violent, to be perfectly honest with you. On the other hand, you've got this group of outsiders. They're not Chinese. They are outsiders. Technically, therefore, they're barbarians because they're not Chinese, but they're very Chinese-like because for years they have been hiring Chinese and they treat those Chinese very well. So if you're that Chinese official, who are you going to be loyal to, right? You're probably going to be loyal to the Manchus. Yes, they are outsiders, but hey... They're not that bad. A good real life example, there was this general named Wu Song Gi, right? Uh, and, and he had a decision to make. He had to decide. He was protecting the border of China. Do I side with Li or do I side with the Manchus, right? You know, at least Li is Chinese, but he is uneducated and his army is rather violent and he does have a lack of control over those violent peasants. The Manchus. Well, they're Manchurian. They're not ethnic Chinese, so that's a big negative, but they have a Chinese style of government, and they already have Chinese in the military and the government that they treat quite well, and General Wu actually sided with the Manchus.